Let's go over what to do when care is delayed. So when you find yourself too far away where EMTs can't get to you, help can't get to you, what do you do in those situations? So a major topic is splinting because normally if you're going to move the victim, you're going to have to splint the injury if they have injured a limb or their spine or their neck. So the purpose behind splinting is to reduce pain, prevent further damage, prevent a closed fracture from becoming an open fracture, reduce bleeding, and reduce swelling. And we normally only use these improvised splints when we're going to have to move the victim. So if you were on campus and you got injured, it's best just to call 911, not have anybody move you, and have the EMTs come to you because they'll have their own splints, commercial splints, that are form-fitting, easy to put on. But if you're out in a situation, maybe you've been hiking, maybe you're a day away or a half day away from help, maybe you don't have any cell phone service and you're going to have to move a victim, somebody that gets injured, and you're going to have to splint a limb, that's when improvising a splint comes into play. So rule of thirds. So if the injury happens near the joint, you want to include the joint in a splint. So for example, if I damaged the lower third of the humerus near my elbow, the elbow would be included in that splint. I would go from my shoulder all the way down to my wrist and include that elbow in the splint and leave it in the position that it's found in. Elbows, knees, you don't want to move them unless circulation is being cut off and it's caused by the position that the joint is in or the limb is in. So if it's in the middle of the bone, let's say I've broken my radius and ulna, then I, and it's in right in the middle of the forearm, I would go from elbow to wrist. If it was in the upper third, closer to the elbow, then I would include the elbow in the splint. So it goes back to what I was talking about before, but it gives you a rough idea. So types of splints. You have improvised, which would be like if you were out hiking and had to cut tree limbs to make a rigid splint, that would be improvised. Or if you had to take your jacket off because somebody had a wrist injury or ankle injury, those are all improvised. Commercial would be something that you have. They have those ones in the military that unfold. That's a commercial splint, or the ones that EMTs have. Those are also commercial, something that you bought that is designed to act as a splint. And then you have the three main types, which are rigid. So they're mainly used for like long bones or for the spine. So if those have been damaged, you could take like a tree limb. That would be an example of a rigid splint and sandwich a limb in between two tree limbs that are padded with maybe your jacket or something that's rigid soft splint would be like taking a sleeping bag putting it around an ankle a big bulky soft splint that's form fitting to prevent the ankle from moving around but also pads it and anatomic would be finger to finger so a lot of times like in wrestling or football or basketball a lot of sports, sometimes the pinky fingers or your fingers get dislocated and you can tape one finger to the next. That would be anatomic. Or your arm to your body, that's anatomic. Or leg to leg, another anatomic splint. Injuries, you have closed fractures. So the long bone has been broken. This is just an example. It doesn't have to be a long bone. But a long bone broken but it's not completely broken. So the fracture goes through it, but it's still connected. That's a closed fracture. Um, now it could be completely broken, but it hasn't punctured through the skin. So an open fracture punctured directly through the skin. That would be an example of an open fracture where the bone is protruding through. So if, I, if you've ever seen some of those soccer injuries or skateboarding injuries where somebody's tibia, because of how they landed, and the leg folds back and the tibia pokes through, that would be an open fracture. Then you have dislocations. It happens a lot to shoulders, um, knee dislocation, ankle dislocations. All of those are types of soft tissue injuries. 
which can result in sprains. So there are differences between strains and sprains. So a sprain is you've damaged the ligaments, the soft tissue inside of a joint. That's an example. A strain would be to a muscle. So like if you pull a muscle, that's a strain. If you damage ligaments inside of a joint, that is a sprain. So common to all sprint, splints, you want to check for circulation first. So we need to know, does that limb below the injury site still have circulation? If not, we may have to manipulate it because if care is going to be delayed and it may take us a full day and we know that skeletal tissue like muscle and skin will die without oxygen within three to six hours and there's not oxygen getting to it, we may have to manipulate and reduce that joint to get circulation reestablished. That's only if circulation is being cut off. That way they don't lose that limb. If there are any open wounds, maybe a bone poking out, then we cover those. You want to tie the knots against the splint itself. So if it's a rigid splint, up against the wood. If it's a soft splint, up against the padding. But we don't want the knot to be pressing up against somebody's skin. It could cut off circulation, plus it's uncomfortable. So we tie the knots off above and below the injury site. So let's say I've broken my tibia right in the middle. I'd want the knots to be up near my knee and down near my ankle. I wouldn't want to tie off any type of splint directly near that injury site. I could cause an open fracture and I could cause discomfort. So I want those knots above and below the injury site. And then once you get a splint on, you need to check for circulation again because if you had circulation before and you put the splint on and now you don't have circulation, the splint is what's cutting it off. And so you may have to redo it, redo it, retie it until you reestablish circulation. So how do you check for circulation? Well, if somebody's got a shoe on, a big bulky shoe and they have an injury, I don't want to take that shoe off because it's actually a compressive bandage. So I may have to do more of a common sense test. Circulation, sensation, movement. I'll ask them, are you getting pins and needles? Does it feel like you got circulation? Can you feel this? You know, touch the toes. That's more of a common sense CM, CSM test. Circulation, sensation, movement. If you can get to a pulse that is below the area, you can check a pulse. But again, I don't want to remove anything to, to have to get to it. I'll normally just use a common sense test, like ask them if they can feel me touching their toes or their fingers or whatever. Watch this video, answer questions on your lecture notes about it. So cooling systems, thermal regulation, overheating. So if you're out working out in a hot environment, your blood is a thermal regulator. It runs through your limbs as sweat evaporates, helps cool off the blood in your extremities. It comes back to the core and cools off the blood in the core. But you can generate metabolic heat faster than you can lose it. If you get too hot, you can cook the brain and your vital organs can be damaged and you can have permanent damage by getting too hot. So there's two main ways that you're gonna mess up enzymes in your body and enzymes are just proteins, right? Bundles of proteins. So if you get too hot, heat will damage proteins and denature them, and so will acid. And both of those can be done through vigorous exercise. So if you've ever seen an egg cooked in a skillet, and then the egg white turns white when you heat it up, that's a denatured protein. The same thing can happen if your body gets too hot, you can denature the proteins in your body, which are enzymes, and so enzymatic reactions won't happen like they should, because you've gotten too hot and the body starts to um, mess up and physiological processes don't work or work like they should. So heat loss, sweat evaporates, helps cool us down. So they kind of, your long limbs, if you have long limbs, act like radiators. So I'm more of a ectomorph, long and lean. I do really well in the heat 
because sweat evaporates, cools off the blood in these long, thin limbs, and that blood goes back to the core and cools me down. So they act like a radiator. If the ambient temperature, the outside temperature, is 70 degrees or less, you really won't have too difficult of a time staying cool enough. If it's the closer it gets to 98.6, your body's normal body temperature, the harder it is for you to cool off. If your body temperature gets greater than 109, it can be fatal. So water loss plays a big role. So 50 to 60% of your weight should come from water. So if you've ever done a bioelectrical impedance test and they said that you were dehydrated, that's because you were under 50%, that messes that test up. So we need to be 50 to 60% water, our weight comes from water, to be hydrated. About two quarts of water are lost daily through breathing, urinating, bowel movements, sweat. And your body can only absorb 1.5 quarts an hour. You can actually lose more water than you can take in. So if you've ever played sports and you've gotten dehydrated, but you're like, man, I'm drinking plenty of water, well, absorption rate plays into that. So you may be taking in a lot of water, but you may not be absorbing it all. And it takes a while to absorb it. So sweat loss, two quarts an hour in a hot environment. So if you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated. That's a key indicator. In the military, they monitor their urine output. So when they go to a uni ur urinal, especially in the guys' urinals, urinals, I know they have them, they have a shade chart for urine. So when they go to the bathroom, they can look at the shade of their urine. The darker it is, the more dehydrated. The clearer it is, the more hydrated. So if you are producing clear urine five times a day, you're hydrated. Caffeine is a diuretic, causes you to go to the bathroom more often, and so you lose a lot of fluids that way. Alcohol, same thing. Soda, it's got a lot of sugar in it, so it slows absorption rate. Some of them have caffeine in them. Fruit juices, again, sugar concentration so high, it can take longer to absorb the fluids. So that's all things that you should consider. So electrolyte loss. Potassium, sodium, chloride, those are our three big electrolytes that we need to replace. So if you look at Gatorade, that's what made the Florida Gators, where it was invented to replace those electrolytes. Because what they found is their football team, in third and fourth quarter, they were cramping up. And it was due to electrolyte loss, not replacing those electrolytes. And then they came up with Gatorade, which eventually made its way out into the market, to help replace those electrolytes so people wouldn't cramp up. And they became a third and fourth quarter team, outplaying people because they weren't cramping up in that Florida heat. So less than 8% sugar, that's good enough to, anything greater than that will slow absorption. You may have heard of people drinking pickle juice, it's just because of the sodium that's in that, in the pickle juice, and that's helping people retain more water, keeping them hydrated or replacing those electrolytes. So humidity plays a big role. I can get on a treadmill and run on a hot, humid day and just sweat like crazy. I can come in the next day when it's drier, less humidity, and not sweat hardly at all going at the same speed, and my heart rate is about 10 beats lower because I'm not having a hard time cooling off. The sweat's evaporating, cooling me off. In a humid environment, you're going to have a hard time cooling down because your sweat is not evaporating fast enough to cool you down. A dry heat just wicks moisture away, so it's real easy to get dehydrated in places that are pretty dry. Heat illness, so you have heat cramps, key indicator that that electrolyte loss, muscle spasms, and then you have heat exhaustion and heat stroke. People get these confused. So here's an easy way to tell the, the two apart. Sweating, thirsty, you have flu-like symptoms. All of those can happen with heat stroke, shortness of breath, fast heart rate. But really, how to distinguish the two apart 
is if somebody has an altered mental status, they're kind of in and out of consciousness, not making a lot of sense, and they have lack of sweating, and that's a key indicator that they're going into heat stroke. That can be fatal. Extremely hot, flush skin. And you have two different types of heat stroke, classic versus exertional. So classic is like the slow cooker. You know, you're, you hear about people in Chicago when it gets 90 degrees, they don't have AC units and they start having heat stroke. They just, it gets hotter and hotter and they just, for some reason, can't cool down. They're not acclimated to the heat. Exertional would be something that you see with people that play sports in the heat. So you hear about two-a-days or, or people that are working construction, they're out in the heat, doing outside work. That would be exertional heat stroke. So care for heat exhaustion. So get them out, get them into a cool place, get them out of the heat. Give them cool liquids. Not only does that rehydrate them, but you get those cool liquids to the core, helps cool them off pretty quick. Place ice packs near the core, up near the neck, the carotid arteries, down near the femoral arteries, armpits, all that good stuff. Uh, so the femoral arteries will be in the legs, so you can place it pretty close to the hips or along the inner thigh. And then up in the armpits to get near, near the brachial artery, up near the carotid arteries, all of those large, huge arteries will help cool the blood supply down fast and cool them off. And if there's no improvement within 30 minutes, seek medical care because they could go into heat stroke, which can be fatal. So same process for heat stroke, get them out of the heat. You may have to strip them completely down to the underwear where, and then slowly bring down their body temperature. I've seen some books saying the fastest way to cool somebody off is to drop them into an ice bath. Well, yeah, that'll cool them off, but it could put them into an arrhythmia. So you can put them into cool water and then slowly bring the temperature of that water down. That works but you don't want to just drop them into an ice bath. It can be dangerous. And if you think they're suffering from heat stroke, make sure you call 911 as soon as you can. So watch this video, answer some questions about it on your lecture notes. So cold related emergencies. We don't see this too much down in South Texas, but it can happen. If you get cold enough, get into the Guadalupe, not pay attention to how cold you're getting, and then a rainstorm comes in or something, you could get pretty cold. So hypothermia, we need to warm the body back up. Slowly but surely, wrap them in blankets, get the cold, wet clothing off of them and wrap them in something dry that you can warm them up. Frost nip, that's just the surface of the skin, slowly warm it back up. And frostbite can be superficial or deep, just like burns. So care for hypothermia. So signs that they're going into extreme or severe hypothermia, there's no shivering. Altered mental state, they're not making any sense or making poor decisions. Slow heart rate, because their metabolism is also slowing down. And slow breathing rate. So call 911 as soon as possible, remove any wet clothing. Um, give them CPR if they're not breathing or no detectable pulse. And apply heat to the core, not something that'll burn the skin. Slowly bring that body temperature up. So frost nip, super, it's on the epidermis, so it's not deep. Gently warm the areas. So you don't want to just take super hot water and drop their hands in it. That can be painful. And don't rub the area. So just dip it in lukewarm water and slowly bring the temperature of that water up as they can handle it, as long as it's not painful for them. Care for frostbite. Remove them from the cold, obviously. And don't allow the person to use that affected area that can do more damage to the underlying tissue especially if it's completely frozen it can rupture those cells cause internal bleeding so more than two hours from help you want to get them into shelter and rewarm that area so 100 degrees 104 degrees you don't want it to be too hot because then you can do damage and they may not be able to feel the skin so if you got it above 113 degrees, that can cause damage to the skin. So around 100, 104, 
add water to maintain the temperature. Just the coolness of their hands may cool down the water that it's immersed in. Give them ibuprofen for pain relief. So this is really similar to burns. And do not rub the area. Place bulky dressings around the area. That will help keep it warm but also um, reduce the risk of infection and elevate. So here are some different types of common wounds that may happen even if care is not delayed. Abrasions would be like rug burn, just taking the epidermis off. Puncture wounds, so if you get stabbed by a knife, bitten by a person or a dog, those can be harder to clean because it's hard to get down into the wound and get all that bacteria out. Incision would be cut by something really sharp like a scalpel or a sharp knife. Laceration, the edges of the skin are torn. So skin is ripped open. You brush up against something that maybe it's not sharp or not very sharp and it tears the skin as opposed to cut through it. Avulsion would be where a piece of skin is hanging down, it's still attached. And then you have amputations and you have different types of amputations. So you have a guillotine amputation where it's completely cut off, nice and smooth. You have crushing injuries where um, a limb or a digit gets stuck between something and gets crushed off. And you have deglovings. I see this a lot in sport where people don't take off their rings and they go up to slam a basketball. The ring gets stuck on the, ring, on the rim and it just peels the skin off like a sock. A lot of the tissue is still there, the bone is still there, but the skin is gone. So I just want to warn you, if you're queasy, don't look at this next photo. Just turn the video off now. I'm going to show you an example of a degloving. That's a degloving. So you notice here, ring finger, ring ripped off the skin. There's the skin peeled off like a sock, setting in this person's lap.